Has anybody ever seen water stop in resin? It's a little bead about the size of a ball and a ballpoint pen. It's a polystyrene bead that is manufactured so that it has a positive charge. The next drink of water you take, and, and stop thinking about this for a minute too. There is no new water. Water is a finite thing on the planet. It falls to the ground from the sky, it goes into the aquifers, and it evaporates up. That's the hydrologic cycle, right? There's no new water. You can't make any new water. It's, it's finite. The next, the next drink of water you take could be maybe Eve washed the apple she gave Adam in that next drink of water. Or maybe a dinosaur took a crap in a pond of water that, that next glass of water you're drinking. There's no new water. It's, it's a finite substance and it's the universal solvent. It dissolves a little bit of everything it touches. That can be good and that can be bad. It can be bad in the sense that, for instance, we live in Indianapolis. And Indianapolis sits on limestone. A lot of limestone. So what happens is with limestone, when the water touches the limestone, guess what? It pulls calcium and magnesium out of that limestone. And what does that make the water? Hard. Hard. Hard water. Chicago gets most of their water from Lake Michigan, I guess. There are a lot of, a lot of there's some wells involved. But typically, Chicago's low in hardness. It's not very hard. Indianapolis might be 20 to 25 grains of hardness. Here is sometimes three to six grains. What's a grain? A grain is a measurement. It's a unit of measurement. One grain. Let me put it in something that we can think about. It takes 7,000 grains to make a pound. Okay? So if you've got water that is 20 grains hard, you can divide that into 7,000 and find out how many gallons of water you would have to draw to make one pound of dissolved solids. Uh, have, any, have any of you worked in areas other than Chicago? For instance, in Indianapolis, you take a water heater, a plumber can carry that water heater down the basement himself, 40 gallon water heater. Sets in the basement for 10 years, it takes three men and a wild monkey to get up out of there. You know why? Because it's full of that lime in the bottom. It weighs about 100 pounds more than when you brought it in because what happens is at the bottom of that water heater, especially if it's a gas water heater where the flame is, creates hardness scale and builds up and builds up and builds up. Eventually, they shut this whole system down. Well, back to grains. Hardness is one of the most common things that we see across the planet. Hard water is, is a major problem in a lot of areas. Not so much in Chicago, but in other areas it is, it is a major problem. Since water is a universal solid, it also dissolves chemicals. It dissolves things like PCB, TCE, dioxin, chromium-6, lead. Anybody ever see any lead pipes? Lead. There's a lot of lead in water surfaces around. Uh, all kinds of chemicals, things we can't even pronounce. PFOAs. Has anybody ever heard about PFOAs? It's a, it's a chemical that's applied to cookware to keep things from cooking, like Teflon, or from sticking, like Teflon. The problem is, it has a life cycle that's unlimited. And so, for years, people have been dumping these PFOAs back into the ground, and they're used to fight fires, too. They, they're great for snuffing out fires. If you've got a large area on, on fire, they use them around airports, they use them in the Army, in the Navy, in the Air Force. There's a big fire, they spray it with this PFOA. 
and they're all over the environment. And guess what? They're very, very hard to take out of the water. As a matter of fact, it's probably economically impracticable for a municipality to take it out on a, on a large basis. It's probably going to cost way too much. We all take for granted our water quality. But remember, because water is a universal solvent, there can be all kinds of things in that water because it's going to touch and dissolve a little bit of everything it comes in contact with. Ultra pure water is water that really doesn't have anything in it at all. You've heard of distilled water, the ionized water, reverse osmosis water, it's all very close to that. And so you can't even put that, those ultra pure water in copper pipes because it will dissolve the copper. It will literally leach the copper right out of the pipes. So when you're talking ultra pure water, you're talking using some type of plastic or stainless steel, typically 316, because you don't want to be leaching those things into the water. One of the most common things that is done and has been done for centuries is filtration. Back at the time of the Egyptians and the pharaohs and the pyramids, there's history about how they filtered water, how they even softened water um, through some very uh, interesting means. Filtration is something that we need to think about too. Water can't be just hard, but it can also need filtered. What can be in what can be in the water? Well, obviously, fish and turtles; those are undesirable. There can also be sand, silt, solids, sediment, things that you can see visibly in the water. Um, you can also have bacteria. Bacteria that maybe can be seen like uh, an algae or a fungus in the water, or it could be something that is totally unseen with the naked eye, no smell, no odor, very dead. Talk about Legionella. You can't really see Legionella, but it will kill you. It's in the water. It can kill you, it doesn't always kill you, but sometimes you wish you were dead. Um, there's a, there's a bacteria now that's called the uh, H. pylori bacteria. It's got a big long name. But it's a bacteria that is found in surface water. And if you happen to be breathing while water's being splashed in your face or you're swimming in a lake, this bacteria goes up your nose and eats your brain. People said that's what's happened to me. I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's called a brain eating bacteria that can be very hazardous too. We're finding these things in the water, it used to be only in Australia or maybe in Africa they found it. Now they're finding this in America. <coughs> also, have you ever smelled water that smelled like rotten eggs? It's hydrogen sulfide. Salts are in the water. It doesn't smell good. Three things that we call the stinkers and the stainers. The stinkers are hydrogen sulfide, and the stainers are iron and manganese. You ever seen any iron stains on fixtures or plumbing that was from a well? I mean, it might be the color of that hat. I mean, it literally stains everything. If you've got a white shirt, it's going to be that color. How do you deal with that? So we're going to talk about these things today. Um, First thing we're going to discuss is water quality and filtration. Has anybody ever heard the term micron? Do you know what that is? Again, it's a unit of measure. Uh, I guess you can go submicron, which might be point. Zero, 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 as far down as you can get it. Or anything over about 25 microns, you can see with the naked eye. 
and <coughs> filters up to 200 microns. Typically, they don't make it much higher than that because you can almost filter out salt all of that. Okay? But typically, one of the first things that should be in any system, as far as I'm concerned, in any system, in any plumbing system, whether it's on Chicago water or any water, is a whole house filter. To filter out the sand, sediment, fish, turtles, things like that. Typically, you may not see a lot of that in the water, but when the city goes out and flushes hydrants, you ever see the water come out this color sometimes, uh, and it can stir things up in the, in the water mains, you can literally have pieces of gravel come through. And guess what happens when that gets in a water treatment device or a shower? A shower converter, tub converter, typically they're going to call a plumber to come out and fix it because that that's going to jam, gum up the works. It's going to prevent that shower and burner from working properly. So one of the most important things you can do is to put a filter, a whole house filter. You grab one jar and uh, just, just to show you an idea, and I'm sure you've all seen these before. But it's one of the best protective devices you can put in your house, one of the best insurance uh, policies you can get because it's going to protect everything uses water in your house. This is this is a four and a half by <clears throat> twenty filter housing. They make these in four and a half by tens. This is one inch in and out. Typically make them in three quarter or one inch. Uh, if, if you have a large house you may want to use the 20 inch. If you have a smaller house you may want to use the 10 inch. Uh, you typically get over 20 gallons a minute or something like this. So this is a good insurance policy to protect your dishwasher, your washing machine, your diverters, your plumbing, and just to prevent things from getting into the house in the, in the water lines. Um, this is the size filter that it uses. We'll come back to this a little bit later, but I just wanted to get you uh, so that we're talking about the same thing. Typically, in times past, We've typically told people that they need a 20 micron filter for the whole house. I've kind of changed my tune to that in the last few years because of some of the contaminants that we're dealing with. We recommend a 5 micron pre filter on houses. Now, some people say, well, it plugs up in six months. I guess it's good as a job. I mean, if you buy a filter, don't you want to filter things? I mean, if you put a 200 micron filter in there, maybe you wouldn't have to change it, but every 10 years. But it's not going to take much out. This is a pleated polyester filter. You see, it's, it's got pleats in here, and it's, this ha happens to have about 36 square feet of filter media in it. Pleated filters are the best <coughs> choice for a whole house. There's other type of filters too. There's what's called sediment depth filters. And but most, of this, most of the filtration is on the outside. And so they plug up very quickly. Maybe you've seen string wound filters where they have string wrapped around filters. Has everybody seen string wound filters before? Um, string wound, a lot of people say, well, I love string wound filters because they last long. And again, they last a long time because they don't filter very well. It's hard to beat a pleated polyester filter. Some people think this is paper, but if you make it out of paper, bacteria in the water will attack the paper, eat it, and all of a sudden you take it out and it's holes in it. Pleated polyester, the bacteria don't like to eat. So a filter like this protects your investment, your hole. And, and I, I strongly advocate putting these, no matter how good your water quality is, I strongly advocate putting something like this on the question. Okay, the micron, that's the size of the orifice that the water has. That's the size of the, the particles or whatever, and that's what it will go to. Oh, it's the size of the particles. Yeah, this is, the pore size in that is five micron. <laughs> and that's what's called nominal. So it's within about 10% of, of that. It's not, it's not always exact. It might be four microns, it might be six or seven microns. But it's right around that area. So it'll filter out anything that's five micron or greater. Uh, so anything that's 
that's bigger than five microns it's going to take out. Now, sometimes if you've really got some crappy water, sometimes you're going to take and put two of these or three of these, sometimes even four of these. And what you might do is you've got the first, so let's say we've got four of these. We have brackets of these quad brackets you can mount all, all four on. And you can go through the first one that might be 20 microns. Maybe you've got a lot of bigger pieces in it. <coughs> then you can go to the second one, which might be five microns. You can go to the third one, which might be one micron, and the fourth one, which might be a half micron. That's called step-down filtration. Step-down filtration is very effective when you have lots of dissolved solids of different sizes in the water. And if you just put a half micron filter in there, that filter might plug up every two weeks. But with this scenario, it might go six months or a year because this is doing most of the work. One nice thing about this is on the 20, you can't do it on the five and down, but on the 20, you can wash this off. Take it out, you can hose it off, put it back in. The five, the one micron, and the half micron, you can, really, you can do it, but it's not really going to be beneficial because the micron size is just too small. Okay. Now, this is just one type of filter. This is, this is a, we, we talked about pleated. Pleated filters are absolutely the best for a whole house filtration. But sometimes there's other things in the water too that they you want to take out. So they make carbon filters, the same size. You've probably seen smaller filters. We didn't bring any with us today, but you've probably seen smaller ones. Typically filters come in four sizes, whole house filters. They come in two and a half by 10, two and a half by 20, four and a half by 10, and four and a half by 20. I do not consider the two and a half format size to be a whole house. Some people do, I don't. I, don't, I consider that to be a point of use, not a point of entry. You get what I'm saying? Point of use means a sink, a faucet. Point of entry means a whole house. So, I consider these to be point of entry filters, not point of use filters. Um, but what may happen in some cases, let's say you're on city water, let's say you're on Chicago city water, the water's not very hard, and you just want some good tasting water. Well, you can put a five micron filter here, you can put a carbon block filter here, you can put a granular activated carbon, a catalytic carbon here to take out chloramine. And we have a uh, filter that's called a disruptor. It has a zeta charge. It looks just about like this, only it's made with a different type of media. And it has a positive charge of 51 millivolts. And what that does, what that does is attracts things like lead, chromium-6, bacteria, tannin. Anybody know what tannin is? You've seen iced tea before, right? It's got kind of a dark color. Tannin gives tea its color. Sometimes there's water that's like that. Tannin is from decaying vegetables or plants things like that. So in coastal areas, a lot of times around lakes, you'll sometimes see water, especially in the fall or the spring of the year, you'll see water that has a tint to it. And this, this filter called this disruptor filter can take out things like that. It has a positive charge and also takes out bacteria, virus, and things like that too. Again, it's like every other filter though, you just can't, there's not one size that fits all. And you've got to do proper pre-treatment. In other words, if the water has tons of iron and sulfur and hardness and things like that in it, you've got to deal with that first before you do anything like this. Usually you have an indication that your water is bad. There's usually some indication. I mean, if you're married, your wife's going to say, you know, my clothes aren't looking very good. I got all these spots on the shower. 
or things like that. You know, your guys don't always know that stuff. Believe me, your wife doesn't tell you. Um, so one of the things that we strongly recommend is if you don't know what your water quality is, if you're on city water, you can look it up. You can go online and look up what city you're in and the water quality report has to be on there. But if you don't know what your water quality is, then you can get a water test. Well, like on our website, uswatersystems.com, we have a test for 35 contaminants. And it's $49.95. And we send this off to a lab. We, we don't make any money on this. It's not money, of course. It's just a service that we do. And then we've got another one that has a few more contaminants plus bacteria, this bacteria test. And it's $149. So it, knowledge is power. If you know what's in your water, then you're not sure. And that's one of the things we strongly recommend is get a good water test if you're unsure about what's in your water. Because once we know what's in there, and if there's any, maybe you've got a problem with iron, and you say, well, I just need something to take my iron out. Well, what's your pH? What's your alkalinity? What's your manganese level? Do you have any sulfur? Are there any other organics in there that could cause a problem? Those are called competing contaminants. So you want to see what all the competing contaminants are before you're going to treat the water. Okay. Um, so, the first filters we're talking about are sediment filters, like this, which come pleated, string, sediment depth filters, lots of different things on the market that can do that. Typically, pleated are the best. And then we've got carbon block filters, or carbon filters. Does everybody know what carbon is? Carbon's typically made by a couple of processes. One is they take coconut shells and they roast them at about 2,800 degrees, and the char left behind is carbon. Another way is they do the same thing with bituminous coal. They crush it, roast it, and what's left is carbon. And the carbon. Um, my choice typically is coconut shell carbon. Coconut shell carbon typically gives water what they call a sweeter taste than anthracite based carbon. But there may be certain contaminants that respond better to anthracite, so, and there are certain contaminants that respond better to coconut shell. So sometimes it's important to use both. But in most cases, we're going to use coconut shell carbon for drinking water because some of the water is the best taste. Carbon filter absorbs taste. It takes, I mean, they even make air filters that are embedded with carbon because they absorb odors. And so carbon filters are very, very prevalent. Again, though, you've got to think about a carbon filter this size, a pleated filter this size, will flow up to 25 gallons a minute. A carbon filter is not even going to flow half of that because you have to have enough contact time. And it's just not made to float that much water. So you have to take that into consideration. I see people that put a two and a half by 10 inch filter um, on the whole house and put a carbon filter in it and say, I, I can't get any water. <coughs> you know, it'll only flow like two gallons a minute. You know? So these things have to be sized properly. That's one of the biggest things we see. The, the public just is not educated on what size filters to use, what's going to work the best. You know, they may run to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy something that turns out didn't have the basis in the back whatsoever. And then we have specialty filters. And these filters are typically the same size as this, only they've got a plastic casing. And they're filled with some type of medium. They can be filled with softening resin. They can be filled with deionization resin. And we'll talk about how the eye works later. They can be filled with things to take out tannin, nitrates, arsenic, iron. But obviously, you're limited by the size of this. And again, a filter this size typically is not going to take out more than one and a half to three gallons a minute. That's called a media filter. 
So think about that. Putting that on a whole house is probably not going to work unless you're going to manifold multiple ones together. Okay. Filtration plays a real important role though in water treatment, and I encourage everyone to think about. I mean, as, as your plumbers, you know, you're doing the customer a real service when you recommend if you're going out on a service call and they're having proper dishwasher or their, their water heater or whatever, and you see a bunch of rocks or grit or sand in there, the solution is a good filter. And it's a good add-on sale at the same time. So, basic filter 101, very simple, very easy. How much does one like that a whole house filter run? We sell it on our website, and this is not, I mean, this is not discounted. We have discounts for plumbing, plumbers too. I believe this was $169. That includes the program? That includes the program. How much is that all the filters? Um, it's about $49 for this one. But you gotta consider, this has a lot more surface area than like the competitors. Most of the competitors have 20 to 26 square feet of filter area. This has 36. It means it's gonna last longer to build it. So, um, one, thing, one thing I'll get a little plug in about our company. US Water, most of our products are made in USA. Um, see right on here, where that say it's made? Made in the USA. Uh, all the filters are made in the USA. Uh, they're not made in China or Taiwan, they're made right here. And uh, we have a strong proclivity for using American made products. Uh, not always possible for every single thing to be 100% American made. For instance, resin and carbon that's inside filters Resin, which is, has everybody heard that term resin, water slopping resin? It's little plastic beads. There's not, nobody that makes resin in the USA. You know why? Three little words, three little letters. EPA. It's made using, it's a polycarbonate substrate. It's made by using divinyl benzene. It's actually made with divinyl benzene. And that divinyl benzene gets dumped back in the environment. That's why China has some huge, huge environmental issues right now because of dumping things like that. A lot of, a lot of resin comes from China, Taiwan, and India. Some of the worst places for environmental problems. And there are companies right now working on new processes in fact, there's supposed to be one opening up later this year in, in uh, Camden, New Jersey, that's going to be making resin in the USA for the first time in like 25 years. So that'll be nice when that happens. If it does, then we'll be using it in our product. We'll it. Um, so we talked about filtration as being a problem, uh, or treating a problem with water as a solution. Something else that is important is pH. What if I heard the term pH before? Do we know what that means? What does what does pH stand for? Who knows? Yell it out if you know. pH pH simply means potential of hydrogen. pH potential of hydrogen. The pH scale starts at zero. It runs to where? 14. And where's neutral? 7 is neutral. Here's, maybe some of you know this, but usually people don't know this. A pH of 6, a pH of 5, a pH of 4, a pH of 3, a pH of 2, and a pH of 1. How many times more acidic is that than a pH of 7? It is every point on the pH scale is an exponent of 10. So if you have a pH of 3, it's 10, oh, sorry, 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 more acidic. I think the newest age acid that have ever come up with is like a negative 31. Yeah, which is. They've got some stuff as well. So. A pH of 1 or a pH of 0, if you stick your hand in that water, what's going to happen? 
Those are already just again pretty quick. I don't think you're going to leave it in there very long. Same thing with the pH of 14. Life soap. You know, it's going to burn you too. I was reading something the other day. They were saying that crabs and ocean and shells are being started to eat up. I read that. <laughs> Dungeness crabs yeah. are starting to eat up their shells because the ocean is getting acidic. And you know what causes that is what causes the acidity is acid rain, carbonic acid from greenhouse gases, from, from emissions. Um, and right now we're getting real close to talking about the hydrologic cycle and how all that comes into play with the pH as well. So, everybody get that? 10 times, 10 times, 10. You want the water to be as close to 7 as possible. Um, if, it's, if it's much below 7, what happens? Let's say it's 6. And you got copper blown, what's going to happen? You've got to start copper off of pinholes sooner or later. And electrolysis becomes a big thing. Dielectric unions prevent electrolysis, but low pH can also stimulate electrolysis. So it's a good thing to use the dielectric unions if you're using copper. It's also a good thing that if your pH is too low, what are you going to do to raise it? going to neutralize it by a couple of ways. You take a tank that has calcite or manganese oxide in it and you pass the water through that and that will dissolve. That, that media is self-sacrificing. It will dissolve the media and it will raise the pH. Typically you don't want to go, if the pH is below 6.2, you're not going to raise it to 7. Good. The only other way you can raise the pH is with a chemical injection pump that injects soda ash into the water. And the soda ash will raise the beer to whatever you want it to. Adjust it and raise the eight the pump. There's no reason to, you could. Okay? So, we'll go back to water being the universal solvent. And we've, all, we've talked about the hydrologic cycle, how that can be, how it's going to dissolve a little bit of everything it touches. Some people now say, well, you know, it seems like water is worse than it used to be. Well, there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, we're probably pumping, not probably, we are pumping more water out of the ground now than we have ever had at any time in history. So as the aquifers get a little low, we can run into some other problems with like sulfur. The deeper you go, you get sulfur, you get iron, things like that. The other problem is, Greenhouse emissions with small, with, with pollution, we, we get what's called in the, in the atmosphere carbonic acid. And so when it rains, the water that falls to earth, while it might be zero in total dissolved solids, it might have nothing in it, it can have really low pH. Carbonic acid, acid rain. Now, if you're growing cannabis, that's great for cannabis because cannabis loves pH of about 6.2 to 6.5. And if you're growing cannabis outside, you get a nice heavy rain, man, that stuff's going to grow like crazy. But there are other things that aren't, like the Dungeness crabs we're talking about, lowering the, lowering the pH and, and eating their shells. That certainly can't be a good thing. So acid rain is, a, is an issue that we have to deal with. Since the water is a universal solvent, if it's more acidic than normal, when it comes to the ground, it's going to dissolve more of whatever it touches than normal. So yes, our water is getting worse than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. There's more chemicals in there. Since World War II was over, there have been over 38,000 chemicals that have been patented. And none of those get in the water, right? But one of the points I want, to, I want to drive home is I don't think we can take for granted our water quality. You know, you turn on the faucet and take a drink of water, the city's going to give me good water, right? Because the government's never going to let you down. 
I'm just suggesting that your water is the responsibility of every family, of every, of every person who lives in that household. And we can't take the water for granted. Plumbers protect the health of the nation. And let's stop and think about this for a second. When you get up in the morning, what do you think about doing? You just think about, man, I gotta get to work at 7.30, the boss is an SOB, and, you know. Or you really think about the big picture of what you're doing. You're making people's lives better. You're protecting their lives, even saving lives. Because that's what plumbers do, really. And it, if, you, if you want to boil it down to its basis, that's what you do. You help people. Same thing with water treatment. We get up in the morning, and the other bosses are so big. But we get up in the morning, and we know that we're going to improve people's lives through the quality of their water. And even save people's lives by killing bacteria so that they might not lose their life or get sick. So it's good to think about that. What we do is very similar. You know, protecting people's lives, improving people's lives with water. And guess what? You guys are involved in both aspects. A lot of plumbers we run into are a little bit afraid of water treatment equipment. And hopefully by the time this is over with, you guys aren't going to be afraid of it. Uh, you're going to embrace it and want to make it part of what you do because, again, it's part of protecting people's homes and their lives and enhancing their lives. Um, so we talked about sediment, we talked about carbon taking things out of the water. Um, the next thing that we're going to talk about is the stinkers and the stainers. And the stinkers are hydrogen sulfide, Stainers are iron and magnets. Let me first tell you, you're not going to filter the mount. Now, under the right circumstances, you can occasionally take a filter like this and put some media in it that is that will absorb the iron. But if you have very much iron, you might get 200 gallons out of it and have to replace the filter. And that's not very costly. To take out iron, manganese, and sulfur, they have to be oxidized. Just the way it is. They have to be oxidized. Now, occasionally, in some just the right circumstances, and I'm not going to go into all the details here right now because it's not for me, what we're talking about. Occasionally, you can take out iron with a water softener, a certain level of iron with a water softener, depending on what the hardness is, depending on what the pH is, depending on the alkalinity, and other competing contaminants. But odds are, if you're relying on a water softener to take out iron, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get in trouble probably 75% of the time. It's not going to work. So, we suggest oxidizing. Iron, sulfur, and manganese. Manganese of the three, manganese can be taken out by a water sulfur properly done. At least high levels can be taken out properly done. But iron and sulfur, they have to be oxidized. Absolutely have to be oxidized. How do you oxidize iron? Has anybody ever heard of potassium permanganate? Hopefully you have. Hydrogen peroxide is a great oxidizer. You're stealing my thunder. Uh, <laughs> hydrogen peroxide is a great oxidizer. It used to be since, I don't know, the last hundred years, they've used potassium for magnate. It's a powder that has a purple color to it, but when you add water to it, I mean it turns blood purple. And if you get it on your hands or clothes or floor or anything that's stained permanently, you're going to have to wait months before it's going to get off your hands. Um, so they used to use potassium permanganate with something that's called green sand. Anybody ever heard that? Manganese green sand. And the 
you've got a tank full of manganese green sand, maybe a foot, a cubic foot, or two cubic feet, and as the water passed through there, it oxidized the iron or the salt. And then you had to regenerate it with potassium or manganese. And I've, I've been doing this a long time, and I've seen a lot of houses that you walk in, and there's stains all over the floor for the thing overflowed. And it's, it's a mess. Manganese green sand and potassium for manganese are not <coughs> Green sand is still used, and sometimes they're used with chlorine. But remember this. Chlorine is a great disinfectant. It's not a good oxidizer. A lot of people try to use chlorine as an oxidizer, and it doesn't work very well. Hydrogen peroxide is a great oxidizer, but it's not a great disinfectant. And so they work exactly the opposite of one another. Typically what you'll do is, is you've got a pressure tank here. And are you guys all familiar with well, well systems that we got along that far yet? Some of them, yeah, there's a couple different levels of classes here, but yeah, some of them. So you know with a well, you've got a, a well. You've got typically a pump down the bottom of the well. That pump receives a signal from a pressure switch on the pressure tank. Whenever the pressure drops below a preset limit, it kicks the pump on. The pump supplies water to the house as well as fill this tank up. And when the desired pressure has been reached, the switch shuts it off. Okay? The way a lot of people do have in, the, in, in, in times past, they've used chlorination to oxidize iron and sulfur with very bad results. But for years, they've always did it that way because they've always did it that way. And what they did was they had a chemical feed pump that was typically wired to this pressure switch. When that pressure switch kicked on, kicked on the pump, it activated that chemical feed pump, which was pumping chlorine out of a, out of a storage tank into the water line ahead of this tank. Now, chlorine typically takes 20 minutes contact time before it work properly to make sure that it's oxidizing and killing bacteria. So they usually had to have like a 120 gallon contact tank after that, at least 120 gallons. If, if you flow, if the house is capable of flowing 10 gallons a minute, and you need 20 minutes contact time, you need 200 gallons of contact. Most people, when they put it in, were not getting enough contact time. They didn't have enough room to put 220 gallon tanks in. So they downsized it. So as a result, it even did a worse job of removing the iron and the sulfur, and it did very little for the bacteria because you didn't have enough contact on it. What makes hydrogen peroxide different? Hydrogen peroxide, a couple of things. Chlorine is a deadly chemical. You, I, don't, I don't think you want to drink a glass of it. Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. Guess what? It's a water made out of hydrogen and oxygen. This has an extra, extra oxygen molecule, which makes it a great oxidizer. It's, it's 10 times better oxidizer than chlorine. And so if you've got iron and sulfur, you're going to oxidize it much better than chlorine. And guess what? You don't require any contact time. It oxidizes instantly. Typically, you're going to have a carbon filler after this that uses a, a carbon called catalytic carbon. And it's, it's made with coconut shells, but it's, it's a different process. It's, it's activated a different way. And what happens is you're going to inject the peroxide right before this tank. You're not going to inject it into this tank because when you inject peroxide, you're going to dramatically reduce it. It's going to be dramatically re uh, diluted. You want that peroxide, which we typically use 7% peroxide, you want it to inject right ahead of that catalytic carbon tank. Because what's going to happen is that catalytic carbon serves as a catalyst between the hydrogen peroxide and the iron, the manganese, or the sulfur, and it's going to oxidize it instantly. It doesn't require 20 minutes contact time, it does it instantly. So you want to inject it here instead of here. And typically we use what's called a proportional injection system. It has a meter. 
and whether you're using one gallon a minute or 10 gallons a minute, it's going to inject the precise amount of peroxide that you need to oxidize that iron or sulfur. Now, the limits on iron and sulfur. On iron, anything over 0.3 causes stains. 0.3, pretty low. On manganese, this is iron, manganese, anything over 0.05 causes stains. And with sulfur, anything over point, sorry, anything over 0.3 stinks. It smells bad. We've seen up as high as 100 parts per million. And that's really stinks. I mean, I've had people say, come out to my house and so you cross over this railroad track and roll down your window and you smell it. I'm about half a mile through. I'll turn the water on. It smells bad. Only way you're going to successfully get that out usually is with hydrogen peroxide. Again, though, it takes a good water analysis. You have to be able to look at the water test. You have to consider the competing contaminants. You have to consider the pH hardness, all these other things, and then you can make a successful recommendation as to how to take it out and know that the results are going to work. A lot of people say, well, are you going to guarantee this? Yes. Yes, we are, because if we have the detailed water analysis, we know it's going to work. I mean, if you go up, they don't call it the city tower here anymore, do they? What do they call it? So if you go up there, and jump off, I guarantee you're going to go down. You're not going to go up, you're going to go down. Why? That's just the way it is. Science, law of gravity. Same thing is true with treating water. If you apply sound scientific principles, it's going to work every time. But if you don't, if you don't measure what the water is to begin with, then you run into a problem. You know, I don't know if plumbers say this, but carpenters say it, but it applies to plumbers too. It really applies to plumbers. Cut it off twice and it's still too short. That ever happened to you? Yeah, maybe. Measure twice, cut once. And same thing is true with water treatment. You know, I, I, I heard a speaker say one time, has everybody heard the story of William Tell, the archer, who shot an apple off his son's head, or some kid's head, with a, with a bow and arrow? Well, the story is that I can shoot better than William Tell on his best day, providing, of course, put a blindfold on Mr. Tell and spin him around a few times. If you can't see the target you're shooting at, you're not going to hit it. If you can't see what's in the water, how are you going to fix it? So it all starts with a good water analysis, a good detailed water analysis. So, we talked about filters, we talked about water softeners, and we're going to get into more detail on water softeners in a little bit. This is just kind of an overview right now, so we're going to get started with. The third thing is probably one of the most common things in water treatment is reverse osmosis. Has anybody not ever heard of reverse osmosis? Reverse osmosis was first invented by Gulf Atomic Research long ago, probably 60 or 70 years ago. Um, it was discovered, let's put it that way. Um, it's a natural process, actually. It's called reverse osmosis because osmosis is the, is, the, is the way plants feed themselves, right? You've got a solution that passes through a cell wall from a more dilute to a less, from a less dilute to a more dilute solution. The cell wall serves as a barrier to allow this osmosis to take place. With reverse osmosis, what makes it reverse is we're adding pressure. And by adding pressure, what happens is the cell wall 
rejects the solids. Only the pure water can pass through. And so typically, a reverse osmosis membrane is going to take up to 98 to 99 percent of all total dissolved solids. Again, that's a term that is used a lot in our industry. TDS, total dissolved solids. What are total dissolved solids? They're really composed of two components. Anions and cations. Negatively charged ions and positively charged ions. What are the cations? Anybody know? Calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium. Those are the positively charged ions. Negatively charged ions or anions are chlorides, sulfates, Carbonates, bicarbonates. Okay. Typically, the EPA says if your total dissolved solids are below 250, that's considered to be very good drinking water. Okay. Typically in Chicago, a lot of it's 100 to 150. Brooklyn water is 37, the city of Brooklyn. Indianapolis is about 500. And they say, the EPA, this is not enforceable by the way, these are called secondary drinking water standards, they're not enforceable. But they say that if you have over 500 parts per million of total dissolved solids, you should find it all over the water source. Or put it in the reverse osmosis system. Again, you're not going to see it up here among city water a lot, but out in the rural areas, you'll see more, you'll see more high TDS. Now, if, if your TDS is 500, that simply means that you're going to have 500 parts per million of anions and 500 parts per million of cations. These, these combine together. Calcium carbonate. Sodium chloride, they combine together. So one side's going to equal the other. If you ever see a water analysis, and the water analysis shows 400 on the anions and 500 on the cations, somebody made a mistake. They have to balance out. They have to equal each other. Okay. So cations and anions. Got that? Somebody like me. Very simple, uh, calcium and magnesium is what makes water hard. What a water softener does, it takes out the calcium and magnesium and replaces it with sodium or potassium. You can use sodium, salt, or you can use potassium to regenerate the water softener. If you want to, potassium is like three times the price. Now, the last time I looked, you can buy a bag of water softener salt at Lowe's for 550 bucks. Five bucks, and the potassium is like twenty-four dollars. So it's really expensive. Some people say, "Well, I don't want the sodium in my water." Because let's let's get this right out here right now. A water softener does add sodium to the water. Okay, it's taking out the calcium, magnesium, and it's adding sodium. Now, it's not necessarily sodium chloride. It's more like sodium bicarbonate, more like baking soda, but it still is sodium. You would have to have over 700 parts per million of hardness to add enough sodium to your water to make it so that you shouldn't drink. Even the Mayo Clinic says drinking soft water is not a problem. I don't like it. I don't like the taste of soft water. I can taste the salt. So that's why I have a reverse osmosis system for drinking, because reverse osmosis was originally developed to desalinate seawater. There's nothing that it takes out better than sodium. It's easy to take out sodium. So a lot of people have water softeners. We'll also have a reverse osmosis system just for drinking, cooking, 
watering plants, nine out of ten dogs prefer it, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and you try that with the dog, by the way. Put some tap water and some brew and some RO water down and see which one drinks. Most dogs will drink a good water, unless, unless like mine, you're going to the toilet. Okay. How about we take like a 10 minute break? Everybody want a little restroom break and then we'll start back up on more hot water. See you guys back in like 145.